And I'll just say we're not having dinner tonight because I got to take him straight to the airport, basically. So sorry. Uh, yeah. Anyway, thanks very much. Take it away. Uh, I appreciate the invitation. It's really been great being here. Um, I also appreciate the really nice weather in Boston. It's not quite this nice yet, so I feel like it's my introduction to spring. So uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, sort of an amalgamation of a number of projects. So I thought I'd start by telling you about some of my collaborators that are involved in this. Um, the, the two primary collaborators are Jan Minach and John Swallow. I, I think actually this picture of Jan sort of perfectly captures who he is. He's a really uh, free-spirited mathematician. Um, I think that this monkey somehow used in his number theory class to help prove theorems. I'm not exactly sure, but anyway, it's, it really is who he is. Uh, John Swallow is now actually a provost at uh, um, Swanee, um, which is why his headshot looks very professional. Uh, Sunil Chabolu was a uh, postdoc that worked with Jan for a few years, um, and he and Jan and I have been working on some things recently. He's now at uh, Northern Illinois, and uh, Jen Berg was a undergraduate at the University of Illinois when I was a postdoc there. And she and I worked on a senior thesis project that later turned into something else. Um, this talk is brought to you by Coke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So what I'm going to be talking about today is Galois theory. So I thought, I'm sure a number of you remember all the basics about Galois theory, but I figure slide one should be something that's reasonably understandable. So let me remind you what Galois theory is all about. Here's a definition for what it means for a field extension to be Galois. It may not be the one that you're used to seeing, but it really is the same thing. So we say an extension of fields is Galois exactly when those automorphisms of L, which fix F, are exactly um, uh, yeah, sorry, the, the, the things, the automorphisms, um, <laughs> so typo number one, I believe. Uh, what this should say is uh, those, the, the things that are fixed by the automorphisms of L that fix F are exactly F. So there's not somehow some bonus stuff that gets fixed by the automorphisms that fix F. It's really only F that gets fixed. Um, when this happens, we say that the Galois group is exactly those automorphisms of L that fix F. Um, and you may recall that when you have a finite extension, that, that just means that L is a, a finite vector space over F. So when that happens, then there exists some nice polynomial, so that L is isomorphic to, you take the polynomial ring over the base field and you, you quotient by the ideal generated by that polynomial. So in fact, if you go back and think about these things historically, um, it's probably better to think about the Galois group associated to a polynomial, right? We now think about field extensions, but historically the motivation is really about thinking about the groups that are attached to these polynomials. So occasionally we'll be thinking about things from the polynomial perspective as well. All right, so the big theorem in Galois theory says that when you have a Galois extension, then it's possible to enumerate the intermediate fields of the extension by just looking at the uh, subgroups of the Galois group. Of course, this is very exciting because typically speaking, the things on the right are kind of hard to get your hands on. Field extensions usually have an infinite number of things in them. It's not so clear exactly what they might look like. On the other hand, uh, your Galois group is typically a nice finite thing, and it's pretty easy to write down the subgroups. Uh, something we're going to be using actually quite a little bit. Uh, if you happen to have a normal subgroup of your Galois group, and if the field that's associated to that normal subgroup is called K, then there's this nice short exact sequence that you get from Galois theory. <clears throat> so it says that the Galois group that's attached to that uh, field that corresponds to the normal subgroup, of course, sits as a subgroup inside of the big Galois group. And then if you look at the quotient, you actually get the Galois group of sort of the, the base extension. Okay. So with these things in mind, <coughs> let me just say that the sort of Galois theory of a field captures a lot of things that are interesting about the field. I won't talk about that a lot, but, but knowing that the Galois theory of a field is interesting, it, it might be um, important to know sort of everything that you could know about the Galois theory for a field. And there's sort of a, a fancy contraption that does that for you called the absolute Galois group. And you can think of this in one of two ways. Either what you can do is take your field F and look at a separable closure and then try to attach a group to that thing. Or really, the way that this gets defined, you just take a limit over all the finite extensions of that base field. Okay? And so there's the sort of uber object that captures all the Galois theory for F simultaneously. <coughs> 
So uh, this is called the absolute Galois group for the field. I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, the complex numbers are algebraically closed, so there's nothing exciting happening there. So of course, its absolute Galois group is trivial. Real numbers are not a whole lot more interesting than that. You can go up to C, and then once you're there, you're algebraically closed. So you get Z mod 2. Uh, if you have a finite field, it's not too hard to show that the absolute Galois group is the sort of completion of the integers. That's just because the only kinds of extensions that you get for finite fields are cyclic ones, and they sit in a sort of very natural structure of a lattice, and the thing you get back is, is Z hat. Aside from three, these three examples and a couple of things that, that come out of this, it's really actually quite hard to come up with more examples. The next thing you might ask is, what's the Galois group for Q? And this, of course, isn't just an impossibly difficult question. So um, as a general rule, if you're interested in knowing the absolute Galois group for a field, you're probably going to be disappointed because it's very, very hard to actually compute these things in practice. Um, in some ways, this is not too surprising. The thing that's great about the absolute Galois group is it captures all the Galois theory at once. But there's just so much structure there that it's really hard to get your hands on that. Can you, um, can you remind the Z hat thing? I, I sort of don't remember what that is. Well, so um, so you you take the lattice. Uh, so the, the lattice is just integer. So if you look at finite extensions, they're all. Uh, if you look at a finite field and look at its Galois extensions, they're all just cyclic things. Yeah. Z mod. Well, I think things. I mean even just what is Z hat like? Uh, oh, it's the completion, completion over the lattice of integer. So you say like. Um, the lattice you draw for the integers is you draw an arrow from m to n if m divides n. Ah, okay. Right, and you just you ah, take so the limit of the associated under, okay, I got you. Right, exactly. Under the oh, building. Cool. Yeah. I didn't know that had a name, actually. <laughs> that's the name. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Uh, you said uh, impossible, I think was your word for g sub q. Okay, so. Uh, does that mean undecided? Formerly known to be undecided? No, no, no. I just mean that it, it, it's, it's very, very difficult to do. And it's certainly the subject of a lot of investigation that there are things that people know about this object. But if you really want to know exactly what it is right now, it, it seems like there's, we don't have a satisfactory answer for that. I, what I really mean to say is very difficult question, yeah. um, very big deal. So one of the questions, sort of, this is not exactly a, a specific question, but um, if you can't, if it's very difficult to know exactly what an absolute Galois group is, what you might ask instead is, um, in what ways are absolute Galois groups different from sort of generic profinite groups, right? So these absolute Galois groups are written as limits of finite groups, so they're profinite groups, but you might want to know, are there some qualities about absolute Galois groups that make them different from just sort of the random profinite group you see walking down the street, okay? So, okay. So um, there, are, there are a lot of very natural questions you can ask once you sort of have just the basics of Galois theory in hand. And, and I think some of the most natural ones are the ones I'm going to write down now. So if I give you a field F and a group G, the first question you might ask is, can you find an extension of F whose Galois group is G? Okay. This is called the inverse Galois problem. And in general, this is a very, very difficult problem. There are some specific fields F for which there are very satisfactory answers. There are some specific groups G for which there are some very satisfactory answers. But in general, if you're, if you're not going to pin down F or G, answering this can be, uh, can be quite difficult. OK, so suppose somehow that you actually know that there is a G extension of your field F. The next question you can ask is, um, can you actually write down a specific polynomial so that uh, the Galois group that's associated to that polynomial is this, is this group G? Okay, so not just sort of abstractly do you know that a G extension exists, but can you actually realize it in terms of a polynomial, the splitting field for a polynomial? Okay, so suppose that you could do this. The next question you might ask is, okay, I have this one polynomial that tells me how to realize a particular G extension. Can I actually find a family of polynomials so that for every G extension, there is one of the polynomials in my family, right? so that um, that G extension is given by the splitting field for that particular polynomial in the family. And then finally, if you're not satisfied with knowing the full family, you might ask, is there some way to sort of collect that family together in a natural way? So you might want to know, is there some polynomial Q tilde, um, no longer in the polynomial ring over F, but now you're going to adjoin a handful of variables T1 to Tn. Uh, and you're doing that so that if you pick up one of the polynomials uh, Q alpha from this family before, then hopefully you can realize that polynomial Q alpha by specializing this generic polynomial at a few places. Okay? In fact, this Q tilde is called the generic polynomial for the group. Right? All right, so all these questions are um, very interesting. Uh, they're also all very hard problems. And, and you, know, you can see they're sort of nested in terms of difficulty. Um, there are a lot of things, it turns out, that are known about generic polynomials for small order groups. 
Um, and if you're interested in them, there's a book called Generic Polynomials uh, that, that captures a lot of this information. I'm probably not going to be talking a ton about generic polynomials. I think sort of, I'm going to give an example in a second, and certainly it's sitting there in the background, but that's sort of not the goal here. But I, I think these are a nice collection of natural questions to ask once you start thinking about Galois theory. Uh, okay, so let's do some examples and, and try to get at um, these questions of the inverse Galois problem, but we're going to focus only on some very simple groups, okay? Um, so the, the simplest group other than the trivial group, so that's not hard to do, but once you move past the trivial group, the next hardest thing is uh, Z mod 2, and uh, the question I want to ask is, uh, is there some nice way for us to sort of count all the Z2 extensions of the field F? So there's a very natural way to generate a z2 extension of a field f, and the way that you do that is you adjoin a square root of something, which is not already a square. Okay? So generically speaking, if you have a z2 extension of a field, it's, it's typically generated this way. Uh, what I mean is, as long as your characteristic doesn't sort of prevent that from happening. So away from characteristic 2, uh, where this polynomial x squared minus s has some problems of its own, um, it turns out that if you're not characteristic 2, then every z2 extension is given exactly by adjoining a square root of something. Okay? Obviously, the thing you're going to adjoin a square root of um, shouldn't be itself a square. So what do you do in characteristic 2? It turns out that there's something very similar. Uh, instead of looking at roots of x squared minus x, you look at roots of x squared minus x minus s. Okay? Um, <clears throat> Now, just like in the previous case, we don't want to attach the square root of something that's a square. In this case, we don't want to attach a root of a polynomial that looks like this when s takes a bad form. So this fancy p of f, uh, this is exactly the collection of things that can be written as uh, an element squared minus itself. Okay? So as long as you're outside of this, you get one of these um, z2 extensions, and any z2 extension can be written like this. So these two things uh, have a name. The first one is called Coomer theory, and the second one is called Arden Schreier theory. Uh, all right, there's actually something a little bit uh, deeper going on here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let J of F be defined as um, vector spaces, F2 vector spaces that are defined in terms of the sets that I just talked about. So when the characteristic uh, is not 2, I'm going to take the elements, the non-zero elements of the field, and I'm going to mod out by the things that are squares. In the case of characteristic 2, I take the additive, uh, the additive group F, and I mod out by this fancy P of F. Um, these things become F2 vector spaces, and it turns out that if you're interested in not just Z mod 2 Z extensions, but if you really want to know, uh, if, if you want to find sort of a Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2 and so on, those kinds of extensions of F are generated exactly by looking at certain uh, subspaces of, of this thing J of F. Okay. So there's this nice sort of linear algebra way to talk about Galois extension in this case, which is great. Um, and, and I guess the way that I think about this, J of F is like a parameterizing space for these kinds of, these kinds of extensions. Uh, okay, what about when P is bigger than 2? <coughs> so, so in some sense you're like, you can sort of almost topologize your sort of space of uh, extensions, right? It's like some kind of cross money. Like yeah, exactly, right, right. Really you can money. think of it that way. Now, the degree to which you can actually do something with that geometry is maybe something we're going to think about. And, and whether you think of it as geometry algebra, maybe. But I think that's right. OK, so when, when p is bigger than 2, of course, you want to know about zp extensions. These are the, these are the next uh, sort of layer of complication for simple groups. Um, yeah, I mean simple in the sort of like, you know, <laughs> technically, yes, simple. But I, I just mean sort of like basic, not so difficult groups. Um, all right, so for zp extensions, how do you generate them? Well, the natural thing to do is to try to join the pth root of something. And you can do that, uh, provided that you have the right roots of unity in your field. So this Cassie P thing is, is a primitive P root of unity. So if that's in your field, it turns out that every ZP extension is given by <coughs> root of something. This is Coomer theory, just like before, except now P is, two, uh, P is bigger than 2. Uh, when you're in characteristic P, that's one of the ways you can fail to have a primitive P root of unity. And when that happens, you get exactly the analog of uh, what we call Arden Schreier theory from before, except now P is 2. So exactly like before, this fancy p of f is now elements that look like a p power minus itself. There's another way to fail to have p roots of unity, though. So you can fail to have p roots of unity because you're in characteristic p, or you might have a sort of fine characteristic, but you just may not have those elements. 
And so you actually get something which is like Coomer theory, but with descent. So let me just sort of wave my hands over this a little bit. So <clears throat> when you're in the case where you don't have a root of unity, but you're not characteristic P, the theorem is that L descends from um, a field. Oh, so what you do is you, uh, you have your initial extension F, and you join a P to root of unity so that you actually have the appropriate roots of unity. Now Coomer theory kicks in, and all ZP extensions look like adjoining the P to root of some element. Um, and uh, so let me just sort of point out that uh, if you look at the Galois group that's attached to this extension here, it turns out that it's cyclic, and it's generated by an element that I'm calling epsilon here, and it's defined by its action on the primitive p through unity, because it's the generator for the field. So if you let uh, this epsilon act on a CP, and it, it sends it, let's say, to the C power of uh, a CP, then it turns out that um, uh, this element S that, that you get as a Coomer extension over here satisfies that same condition. So epsilon acts, oh whoops, I changed my epsilons. Uh, this epsilon is going to be the same as that epsilon. But this epsilon acts on S just like it acted on CP. It acts by that uh, C power. So what you really want to think is, um, if you want to parameterize the ZP extensions of F, what you do is you look at the Coomer theory for this field, and you're taking a certain sort of eigen component of that thing. So it's very much the same flavor, except you have this additional action, and you just take this sort of piece that looks like an eigen module under that action. So that's that's the other case. All right. So just like before, it turns out that you know even though these give you nice parameterizations, you can actually do a little bit more. So if I define J of F just like I defined it before, so it's P power classes when I have the right roots of unity. It's this F mod fancy P of F when you're in characteristic P, or it's this eigen module when you happen to be in the right characteristic, but you don't have the roots of unity you would like. So if you take that FP vector space, then just like before, if you want to know about sort of um, many-fold copies of Z mod P as a Galois group over F, you again, you just look at sort of this Grassmannian type thing. You look at some um, subspaces inside of J of F, and those are, the, those are the things that parameterize these kinds of extensions. Does that all seem, uh, I want to ask anything before we move on to the, yeah? Is JF always finite dimensional, or are there cases where it can be finite? There, there are cases where it can be finite, yeah. So, in fact, we're going to think later about some applications exactly when J of F is finite. Um, and there are some sort of familiar classes of fields where you sort of know that you're going to get finite things back, or sort of expect that you're going to get finite things back. And, um, but yeah, so I think for most of the fields that you would imagine running into sort of on the street, then yeah, you should think of J of S as this infinite thing, but it's very possible that, that it could actually be finite. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. more about this JMF. So, the, so you said it's a, it, it is itself a vector space over, over FP? Or That's it, right. Yeah, so when, when P is bigger than 2, yeah, this is an FP vector space still. And, but what if your original F was characteristic 0? That? Uh, that's fine. So if it's characteristic 0, then one of two things happens. Either it has its roots of unity, in which case it's F mod the P powers. And so the action of uh, FP, you just exponentiate the thing. Right? But if you hit it by the p power, then it sends it into the thing you're modding out by. Right. Or it's this eigen module of something oh, that's I similar. See. So it's still a vector space over at p because you have that p. Here. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You got Thank it. You. you got it. OK, great. So uh, what's the takeaway from these things? I guess the takeaway is that when you look at the simplest possible groups you can imagine, then it turns out we have a really nice answer to the inverse Galois problem. If, and if you go back and look at this stuff, we have sort of generic polynomials and all that kind of stuff. So. It, we really understand um, constructing these kinds of Galois groups, which is really nice. So I, I guess the next question to ask is, now that we understand how to answer the inverse Galois problem for these very simple groups, um, the next question to ask is, how do you actually answer the question for more complicated groups? Okay. So that's what we'll think about now. So we're going to talk about embedding problems for most of the rest of the talk. So here's what an embedding problem is. Suppose that you have a surjection of a group G onto a group Q, and let's, let's call the map pi. Then what we're going to do is we're going to try to answer the, um, the inverse Galois problem for G from an inductive standpoint. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that we have an extension of F whose Galois group is Q. So we're going to pretend like we've already constructed this extension. Okay. So what we're going to try to do is build a G extension of F. And the way that we're going to do it, if you just use the short exact sequence from Galois theory, then what you want to do is first, you want to generate an extension of that field k, <coughs> whose group is the kernel of pi, 
So that gives you sort of this top extension now that has the right Galois group. And this is already setting up to look nice because you know that G is a group that has a quotient onto Q and whose kernel is the kernel of pi. But you're not quite there because even though L over K has the right group and K over F has the right group, it doesn't necessarily mean that L over F is even Galois, right? So we need something a little bit more than that. We need what I'm calling a stitching condition. You need to have a way that makes sure that these two um, extensions that you've chosen are compatible enough so they actually give you the group that you want. So what I really want to make sure is I have, I have this extra extension L over K with the right group, but also that they sort of behave the way they're supposed to behave together. So this has the name, this is called the embedding problem for the subjection over the field K over F. So this is sort of how you do uh, inverse Galois theory inductively. You assume that you have a nice quotient and then you just try to keep lifting up the, up the ladder. Now there are a lot of ways to approach embedding problems and I'm gonna be thinking about sort of one classic way of doing it and then reimagining how you might approach that sort of classic methodology. So, the, the sort of thing I'm going to focus on for right now is when the, the kernel, so when G maps on the Q and the kernel is cyclic. I'm going to think about that for a while. So when the kernel is cyclic, you can actually use second cohomology to do something. It's not very often you get to say second cohomology to the rescue. Or at least I, I don't say that very much. Maybe, uh, maybe Brian says that all the time. But, uh, okay, so suppose that uh, we're in the sort of the embedding problem setup. So K over F is Galois group Q. Um, you have nice characteristic and you have nice roots of unity. This is sort of the prettiest situation you can hope to be in. And suppose that you have a short exact sequence that involves G at the center, and uh, sorry, G in the middle of the short exact sequence, and it maps onto Q. And uh, suppose the kernel of that map is Z mod N. Well, H2 um, keeps track of all the extensions of uh, Q by Z mod M, right? So this extension corresponds to some class inside of H2, which we call gamma. It turns out that the embedding problem over K over F has what's called a weak solution exactly when you take that cohomology class inside of this second cohomology group. There's a natural map from this second cohomology group into this second cohomology group. So we've switched coefficients from Z mod N to coefficients inside of the multiplicative group for K. And how do we do this? K star has these nth roots of unity. They generate a group that's isomorphic to ZM, and we assume that it has the same action on G. So we get a map from here into here. If this, if the gamma that corresponds to this extension is trivial when you map it into the second cohomology group, you get this thing that's called a weak solution. I'm not going to bother telling you what a weak solution is, because typically when people use this theory, here are the two uh, simplifications they make. First, they assume that M is a prime number. And nine times out of 10, they assume that that prime number is two. Okay. Second, uh, when that number is prime, and if you assume that the short exact sequence isn't split, then you can actually just get rid of this, this weakness condition. You get what they call a, you know, a legitimate uh, solution to the embedding problem. Okay, so, and that's the situation we're thinking about. This kernel is not just cyclic, but it has order P, and we're just going to pretend like the short exact sequence for the time being isn't split. Typically, when people work on these kinds of problems, it's actually fairly easy to solve a split version of the embedding problem, and so they, they break out this tool when they finish the split version. This, by the way, is called a Brouwer type embedding problem. Okay, so that's the fancy name for it. We'll talk about that in a second. <coughs> All right, so how does this thing actually get used? Well, I, I said that if you take the cohomology class gamma and you map it into this, second, this other second cohomology group, that's the thing that's sort of measuring whether or not you get a solution. So this class, if you look at its image inside that, that other cohomology group, this is called the, the obstruction to the embedding problem. And it's not too hard to show that the obstruction itself sits inside the P torsion of what's called the Brouwer group. And the Brouwer group, you can just think of as, it's an equivalence class of a certain family of algebras. Okay, so there are these very sort of concrete um, algebraic constructions. And it sits inside the P torsion of, of this group that, that uh, measures these things. Brian, you're making your eyebrows are doing this. Are you, you wanna ask something about it? Uh, well, yeah, no, it's just, I don't know, I guess, right, so. Obstruction sits in, so the gamma is an element of the cohomology group, I guess. Was, so is the Brouwer group some subgroup of that? It's so it turns out that that cohomology group sits inside of another cohomology group, which is exactly the Brouwer group. Okay. Yeah, so the Brouwer group itself is H2 of something that involves the absolute Galois group. Ah, okay. that's, that's so it's the also thing. constructed in this sort of, so there's this natural map of cohomology yeah. groups from the natural embedding of this, you got it. this thing. Okay. Yep, you got it, you got it, exactly. Um, and since we started off with that kernel being Z mod PZ, that's why it sits inside the P torsion. 
Okay, so how does this, the theorem that I wrote on the previous slide, how does this thing actually get applied in practice? Well, the way that it's used is you try to represent that abstraction in terms of some explicit algebra, right? It's supposed to sit inside the Bra group. You actually try to find the algebra that represents that class. And when you have that algebra in hand, you can start doing calculations. So typically, you take that algebra and you try to sort of mess around with it until it gives you some arithmetic conditions that tell you precisely when that cohomology class should vanish or not. 